Alright, now that we got the ornaments in crime all unboxed and out of the way, let's see what else is in my SynthCube package. Nice! You know what this is? This is the SoundLab Ultimate and the SoundLab Ultimate Expander. Both PCBs. The new black edition from SynthCube. And here's panels. This is the expander panel, the uh, ultimate top panel, the expander top panel, and I suspect that underneath all of it, there's probably the big ultimate panel. Yep. Looking real good. Nice. Synth DIY is fun. Soldering can be a meditation. Making things with one's own hands is very satisfying. And in the end, you're producing instruments to make music with. But there's one part of the process that, for me, is just a chore buying the parts. This is why kits are so much fun. They take that part out of it. But some things don't come in kits, or if they do, they get expensive. Like some of the larger projects out there. Such is the case with the MFOS SoundLab Ultimate Plus Expander project. It's not one module, it's a complete semi-modular containing 20 modules in two PCBs, two main panels and two auxiliary panels. And no panel PCB either, you have to wire up all the panel components to each other and to the PCBs by hand. Nice and old school. I have a bit of experience with another sound lab. The Minisynth Mark II was my first real synth DIY project. After some Atari punk consoles and other simple noisemakers. Sadly, that first Mark II was stolen. So I built myself another, much better one. I love that synth so much, I made an album with it as the single sound source. It's called Songs from Outer Space, check it out on Bandcamp. And a few months ago, I built yet another Mark II for the Argentinian pop star Fito Pais. The Mark II is a newer design by Ray Wilson, and having built three of them, I have some good ideas about how I want my SoundLab Ultimate and Expander to turn out. I built my Mark II as a desktop console, and I really like how ergonomic it feels. So it makes sense to build the Ultimate and Expander the same way. Back when I made my first sound lab, I also built the MFOS analog keyboard with an old Vox Organ keypad I found hanging off a garbage truck here in Mexico City. This keyboard's been abandoned for a while because the contacts I made oxidized very quickly and it would no longer play in tune after just a few months. So I started using a MIDI to CV converter. But after playing a mini Moog for a while recently, I started to really want the feel of an analog keyboard again. So I've decided to restore the keyboard the way Ray taught me to do it with magnets and reed switches. I will set up my sound labs on top of it for a fully analog MFOS system. This is gonna be an amazing setup. To complete the planning, I just need to decide how to deal with power and what kind of signal jacks to use. I think I'll make a single linear bipolar BSU for the whole setup. I use this kind of jack and plug for power distribution. As for signal jacks, I love banana jacks. My Mark II is already a banana synth, and so is my U synth modular. And while I've been more focused on Eurorack lately, I think this synth should be a banana system, just as Ray intended it to be. Banana jacks are unbreakable, color coded, and the plugs are easily stackable, so you don't need passive multiples anywhere. It's no wonder Surge, Bukla, Bugbrand, and other great companies and designers favor this kind of connector. Banana patch cables don't take ground with them, but that's only a problem if you don't ground your systems together. Just plugging them into a common mixer or feeding them from a common PSU solves the issue. So on with the Bill of Materials, or BOM. When I build more than one project at once, like my Usynth Modular, I like to do it assembly line style. Order all the parts, populate all the boards, assemble all the panels, etc. So the first step is to combine the multiple BOMs into a single spreadsheet, consolidating it so there is only one line for each part. I use only 1% resistors, so in the new spreadsheet, I add together all resistors of the same value regardless of tolerance and which project they go to, to make it easy when ordering. Just don't confuse kilo ohms with ohms and mega ohms. It's a good idea to sort all the resistors on your spreadsheet by the value, then copy all the designators of the same value into a single row, update the quantity to reflect the sum total of that value, then delete the redundant rows. I put an X before the designators for the expander to avoid confusion later. 
From my experience with the Mark II builds, I know silver mica capacitors are best for the filter integrators, so I will take note of that on my combined BOM. C49 and C50 on the Ultimate, and C2 and C3 on the Expander will be silver mica caps. Some builders hate tantalum caps and replace them all with a standard aluminum can electrolytics, which should work just as well. Also, I've had trouble sourcing some of the JFETs listed, and the 2N5457 has worked every time, so I just change all JFETs on my combined BOM to 2N5457s. It's very important to read all the texts for both boards in the MFOS website. There's always specific information about certain components, as well as suggested mods, that if you choose to implement, will add some parts to the BOM. Also, consider carefully how everything would turn out, and think about any changes you would like to make, like extra attenuators or connectors, so you can account for those as well when buying parts. And do get sockets for all your ICs. Troubleshooting can get complex on these things, and being able to easily swap a chip might save you time, trouble, and possible damage to the PCB. Ray Wilson's family has graciously sent me a large box full of Ray's things from his prototyping stations. I think I can probably find most of the components I need for the sound labs, and even the read switches for the keyboards, in Ray's old cabinets. I've also amassed a bit of a part stock from many previous projects, so I'll go through all of that as well. I like using these little plastic boxes with divisions to organize what I find, making it easier to populate the PCBs later. Each time I find a part, I check it off my combined BOM, put it in a compartment and label it. Finally, with this reduced BOM in hand, I can start making online shopping carts for all the stuff I still need. I usually get whatever I can at Tata, because they're cheap, they take PayPal, and their shipments normally pass under the radar at customs. After making the Tata cart, I start looking for the remaining parts elsewhere, usually Mauser and Digikey, then finally SynthCube, Thonk, and Small Bear Electronics for the rarer stuff. I always buy more than I need too, especially parts I know I will use many of in future projects. 100 nanofarad caps, 100k resistors, signal diodes, op amps, things like that. It turned out I did have most of what I needed for this build already. I'll even use the very same banana jacks Ray used on his sound labs. So, while I wait for delivery on my orders, I can get started populating the resistors on the PCB and assembling the panel components. That's it! Stay tuned for the next installment of the Sound Lab Build Log. I hope this video was useful. Please like, subscribe, and join my Patreon so I can keep on making cool videos for the SynthDIY community. See you next week!